Buenas noches a todos. Allow me to say, first of all, welcome you here on behalf of Estudio de Comunicación, our associates, BMP Paribas, Nexam, BMP Paribas, our sponsors, Endesa, Deloitte, BME, Prisa, Theca Bank, and Aon, and our collaborators, Linklaters, Equipo Económico, Sex, Eco, and Coffee. This. Uh, every, uh, all these institutions are a group of companies that uh, have been for a long time uh, involved in organizing this, this event between international investors and the main listed Spanish companies. Another year we are, we are bringing together international investors that are meeting with 44 of our main companies, more than 200 investors that uh, belong to 13 countries, among them the most, uh, well, we have here the US, the UK, France, but we have other important countries for investment in Spain. We expect and hope to have uh, to, con continue, to continue this forum tomorrow with more than 800 investors and companies and throughout these uh, or during this meeting we're going to have the government of Spain. And I want to welcome uh, everybody and thank everybody sincerely and thank all the uh, partners, institutions, the uh, Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs, the European Union and Cooperation, who's here and presides over this event tonight, this evening. And uh, last year we competed against the uh, bad weather, the blizzard, Filomena, and this year we got Real Madrid, Barca, Barcelona. So you must uh, um, recognize and acknowledge that um, we we are really uh, putting in our best efforts, but today we don't have to be at the football match. We have to be here at this event and explaining to international investors uh, uh, what our economy, uh, the situation of our economy, the situation of our companies, and how proud we are in Spain to explain to everybody and tell everybody about our country and the situation in our country. We're going to have several speakers. Today we were going to have this meeting at the uh, Stock Exchange Palace here in Madrid. One of the companies that makes this possible is Bolsas y Mercados Españoles. The president of Bolsas y Mercados Españoles and Six uh, was going to be with us and uh, because the crisis has made it so difficult for us. However, he is going to log in from Switzerland and he was going to uh, welcome everybody today and I would like uh, him to welcome us even if it's virtually, remotely from Switzerland. We're going to pass the floor to Joss Dischelhoff, chairman of BME. Event in Madrid. It is now your turn. Thank you very much. And um, I do apologize for not being there, but I think you all understand that given the, um, the COVID situation, it is, uh, it is extremely difficult to make travel happening today. Um, again, good evening. I'm not going to make any comments on the Real Madrid Barcelona match. I'll leave that to the specialist in Spain. Uh, but I really welcome everybody here today and thank you for joining us today. It's a pity, as you mentioned already, that we can't be as originally planned all together in the Stock Exchange building today, but I think in this hybrid form we can still have a very good event. And, and, and to, be, to be prudent and to protect the health of everyone, we are holding this edition of the Spain Investor Day remotely. We thank uh, you, Estudio de Comunicación, BNP Paribas, uh, BNP Paribas Exan, and all the other sponsors for the agility and the great job in organizing the conference in this hybrid form. As always, BME uh, and its mother company, SIX, are very proud to be, be a sponsor and to support the Spain Investor Day to promote, promote Spain as an investment destination. And we know from experience that Spain is a great location to invest in, and we're extremely happy with our collaboration now with the, with the BME Stock Exchange.
In our normal business, we also contribute to the, uh, to the increase of investments into Spain. And as the third largest player in the European capital markets infrastructure landscape, we contribute by providing financing and by attracting global new pools to Spain. Um, and we've done this, of course, against a very difficult uh, backdrop in the last couple of years. So despite the pandemic, our markets have been open, have been functioning and have continued to work normally, thus making it possible for companies and for the public sector to issue and to continue to raise funding through listing, capital increases and bond issues. In this way, our markets um, in Spain and also in Switzerland have been able to continue to contribute to the growth of the Spanish economy. Last year, we had more than 80 capital increases on the Spanish stock market, representing 19.8 billion euros of capital. This is almost a 35% increase compared to last year. Investments and equity financing flows channeled to companies increased or reached 22.7 billion euros last year. This is 42% more than in 2020. The Spanish alternative fixed income market, MARF, also fared very well as its outstanding balance, basically the funding that it provides, saw an increase to 9.7 billion euros during the year. And this means an increase compared to last year of 86%. As you can hear, all these numbers are very encouraging and these are encouraging developments for the Spanish economy and for the Spanish investment climate. And let's hope that these trends continue also in 2022. And let me now conclude by again, thanking you for your attention, thanking you for being here and participating with us, by wishing you an insightful evening and event and wishing you, of course, all good health. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Jos. Confiamos. Thank you. Confiamos en que el año próximo, si estés con nosotros en Madrid, si podamos celebrar este evento en el maravilloso Palacio de la Bolsa y agradecemos a BME SIX su apoyo y su eh, soporte continuado a nuestro evento. For their support en segundo lugar, uh, and all their efforts in organizing this event. We pass the floor now to one of the sponsors. This has given us support for many, many years. Um, one of the uh, big uh, multinational corporations that is seriously committed to investments in Spain. They've worked for many years in Spain. They invest in Spain. They create jobs in Spain. And today we have the honor of having with us the, its new CEO, Jacobo Ornedo. And I'll pass the floor to him. Uh, good evening. Minister for Foreign Affairs, Europe, the European Union and Cooperation Governor of the Bank of Spain, President of the CNMV, ladies and gentlemen, it is for me an honor to welcome you to this event within the 12th edition of the Spain Investors Day. This is undoubtedly the most important financial event in our country, uh, an event uh, where we are present and we have been collaborating with for many years. I would like to highlight the importance of the Spain Investors Day as an essential platform to promote investment and economic growth in Spain. And I want to thank Benito Berceruelo and the team of Spain Investors Day for their work, effort, commitment and enthusiasm, especially in this edition with the extra work that we've had due to the crisis. Uh, 2020 was the year of the pandemic, uh, 2021 was the year of recovery and um, we all uh, hope and expect that 22 is the year of growth and we expect it to be and hope it to be as, uh, that growth as fast as possible. A lot is at stake and we have to make very important decisions in issues such as the European funds, the uh, reform of the working uh, of the labor market, the market, the pensions, taxes, and many other issues. 
The global context is complex. The modern world that we have to live in is uh, a world of uncertainty. We have risks, volatility that are on the increase and have a clear impact on companies and uh, society as a whole. The pandemic, climate risk, uh, failures in the supply chain, digitalization, cybersecurity, working from home, health uh, of employees, the environment, sustainability, etc., etc. In the face of this situation, our option is to our only alternative is to manage these risks and issues in the best possible way by making the best possible decisions and turn these challenges in opportunities if we can. Our determination in 2022 will uh, be at the basis of what we do over the next few years. So Aeon, our goal as world leaders in management of people and risks, has also evolved. Our ambition is to make every one of our customers, to give each of our customers the best information and uh, advice in order to make the best and better decisions that allow them to protect their balance sheet, their employees, and make their businesses grow. Uh, decisions on how to prevent and ensure against cyber security risks or access new forms of capital to cover climate change risks or how to mitigate risks in M&A operations or improve the lives of personnel in terms of their welfare are good examples of our conversations in recent months with our customers and which are going to increase in 2022. Leaders in the, of the business world need to understand the consequences of these long-term risks more and more and be prepared to face up to them. And we must remember that Aeon is in the business of better decisions. And when these decisions are aimed at reducing volatility and improving the lives of people, we think they are especially important. Thank you very much. Jacobo, gracias a OM por su apoyo al proyecto. El año pasado, en medio de la tormenta Filomena, eh, yo agradecía al nuevo presidente entonces de la Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores que su primera intervención pública en aquellas condiciones tan adversas fuera en este foro, en el Spain Investors Day. Eh, un año más tarde eh, contamos de nuevo, aunque en este caso telemáticamente, porque por motivos de COVID ha preferido conectarse con nosotros sin estar hoy presente, eh, Rodrigo Buenaventura, que es el presidente, como todos ustedes saben, de la CNMV y que es el regulador de los mercados bursátiles españoles. Rodrigo, muy buenas noches. investors and uh, companies and this is very important for stock markets because a meeting like this makes it possible for the two parties to come together. Stock markets have become a pillar of modern economies and they should still be so. You may have heard me say in the last uh, few months that capital markets are one of the main tools that we have to promote recovery and the transformation of our economy. I'm talking about decarbonization, but also about digitalization. Both things re require historic investment levels in excess of 30 billion euros extra every year uh, for at least a decade. And this requires the collaboration of four sources of financing, public funds, private equity, capital markets, and banking loans. None of these by themselves, including the banking sector and the capital markets, are going to be able to finance the sheer investment volume required by the Spanish economy in this decade. We need them all. But more than ever, 
the capital markets, as I will explain in a minute, there's a clear consensus in the European Union. European companies need to galvanize more shareholder capital. They can't depend on traditional financing based on banking loans. European companies have 30% uh, of loans on their balance sheets as compared with 8% in the United States. We should move towards a strategy based on the diversification of funding sources, promoting a more healthy balance between banking and non-banking financing. This is not something I say. It is something that uh, the European Council and uh, the European Parliament uh, has said. In the last two years, we have seen how attractive the Spanish market has been in a very difficult context. Capital markets have shown themselves to be a very efficient way for companies to capture funds and to manage crises, giving their financing structures the robustness they need. In Spain, listed companies at the worst of the pandemic showed much greater strength than non than non listed companies. Uh, and also alternative markets made it possible for many companies to issue bonds and uh, notes um, when they needed cash and it was a good way of speeding up the uh, performance of companies in cases where new growth opportunities emerged. It's a stable, efficient, and attractive market for both national and international investors. And being listed in the Spanish stock market is like being listed in any other stock market in Europe. But unlike other European stock markets, it is true that there's few SMEs that resort to this market. If you allow me, I will use a football simile. In the first division, there's about 20 teams, but there's many more teams that are that play in other categories. This pyramid-shaped structure is not replicated in the Spanish stock market. There's only 50 companies, 50, com 50 expansion companies listed on the alternative markets, but this amount should grow in the next few years. Uh, we need to be positive because the number of listed companies in the alternative market has grown steadily in the last few years. And also, we have specific, very successful examples of what it means for growth companies to be listed on an alternative market that allows them to develop so much that they can access the regulated, the, the, the main stock market. We need to explain those success stories so that other companies follow suit. And in my view, we need to conduct an in-depth reflection to promote access to the market by these kinds of companies. And in this endeavor, we need to pull our weight. Lawmakers, both Spanish and European, regulators and market operators have a lot to contribute here. Some recent changes were introduced in the law. For example, the loyalty shares, which make it uh, possible for the founders of a company to exert control over their companies before an IPO. But we also need other initiatives and other measures. We need to promote the market of listed SMEs. And for that, we need different sorts of measures, such as increasing the market culture, 
promoting training and independent advice to companies in the area of financing. We should also see how collective investments can be geared towards SME markets, developing certain vehicles that may address their needs. And we should also favor a greater access of retail investors to the stock market, or we could also develop potential fiscal incentives that make it more attractive for companies to become listed, because this is essential for the Spanish economy. Some of these reflections are present in an initiative of the European Commission, which is now under consultation, which has come to be called the Listing Act. I think it is worth participating in the regulatory debate at a European level because it will affect Spanish markets ultimately. And I would like to encourage the different market agents in Spain to do so. At the CNMV, we would like to keep being very active in this regard, and I hope that issuers and uh, middlemen are also going to be very active. In our capital market, we should also keep up very high standards, especially in terms of being open to foreign investment. Foreign investment is going to be key in the next few years. And from the point of view of investors, the corporate control market and the premiums obtained by shareholders should be preserved. I am aware that in this area there's many interests to be juggled with and the government needs to protect the general interests. But from the point of view of the stock market, being open to the world is a value in itself. For that reason, in my view, it is going to be very positive to normalize the uh, regime used to control foreign investments. This also includes the preparatory work done by CNMV on a potential shareholder involvement code or stewardship uh, code to promote the participation of large investments in the performance of the companies. Um, that they invest in. Before I finish, I would like to conclude by repeating something I said before. Capital markets are a very important asset for the Spanish economy, and it's flourishing. It is essential for the transformation that our economy needs. All of us, issuers, authorities, supervisors, should make the most of these opportunities to promote a market that is well regulated and supervised and which can com com compete with our counterparts and keep playing a very important role on the European arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Chairman of the CNMV. We hope that next year we will be able to have you physically with us. And now the turn goes to the governor of the Bank of Spain. Pablo Hernandez de Cos has not been able to join us physically either but he is connected from the Bank of Spain. Governor, thank you very much for joining us. Once again, we are itching to listen to you talk about the project of the Bank of Spain for the next year. Thank you very much, Benito. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me once again. This is the fourth time, I think, I've been honored to be invited to this event. I'm sure that next year we will be able to see each other physically. Today's event is taking place 
in a circumstance that is clearly more favorable than the previous edition that took place 12 months ago. And this is because of two reasons. First of all, the vaccination campaign and also the incredible support uh, uh, for uh, budgetary policies at a national and at a European level, which uh, has made uh, uh, very um, promising phase uh, possible. Uh, the new variant has uh, caused uh, many infections, and so, well, we're still not in a normal uh, situation. I will just uh, focus on describing uh, what our impression is uh, uh, from the Bank of Spain. I will try and describe what our take is in terms of the economic situation in Spain and uh, mention some of the main risks and uncertainties around us and what, in our view, should be the most appropriate economic policies to manage those risks by the monetary and by the economic uh, policy. The first, the best way of illustrating the improvement of the world economic situation is just to resort, for example, to macroeconomic projections of the in International Monetary Forum. In 2020, GDP fell by more than 3%. Last year, 2021, uh, the figure was between 5 and 6%. And for this year, the, uh, very robust growth is expected of 4.9%. <laughs> If we focus on the Eurozone, of course, the reduction of the GDP in 2020 was higher than elsewhere, 6.5%, twice what it was at a world level. But uh, the policies of the uh, ECB made it possible to achieve robust growth in 2021 and in 2022. The expectation is 4.2 percent growth. So, if this forecast materialized in the Eurozone, we might have already achieved pre pandemic levels. The Spanish uh, economy followed uh, the same trends as other countries. At the, be at the beginning, we were more badly hit than other countries. And then there's different uh, factors that could be mentioned to explain this um, specificity. But of course, Spain, as everybody knows, depends a lot on the tourist sector. And uh, we've been heavily hit by the crisis in the automotive uh, area in the automotive industry. The evolution of uh, employment, however, in Spain has been quite positive. Uh, we can analyze this in terms of the number of hours worked and also in the number of um, uh, workers uh, who have a job. In April 2020, that is the second month into the pandemic, almost one in every four people in the national insurance system before the COVID crisis had either lost their job or were in some uh, furlough scheme. However, if we look at the figures of December last year, that concept and uh, all of these figures were much better at the level uh, at levels of pre-pandemic. The projections of the Bank of Spain that were published together with the projections of the Bank of Europe in December predict that recovery will continue over the next three-year period. In the short term, obviously, 
the econ economy won't be so dynamic. We will be impacted by Omicron, but after that, we expect that activity goes back to greater growth as the distortions of supply chains and different problems uh, become more stable. And all that will be accompanied uh, by the fact the EU um, funds in good financing conditions. The figures published by the Bank of Spain on GDP growth show that for 2021, growth was uh, about 4.5 percent. This year, we foresee a growth of about 5.5 percent. That was the figure we published. And in 23, maybe, f well, 3.9. 4%, 3.9 was the figure we published. And we must also say that the latest update of the National Institute of Statistics for the last quarter of last year uh, reviewed that forecast for last year and for this year. So in terms of when we could recover levels, pre-pandemic levels, we could say that the GDP in Spain would uh, be back at that level between the end of 22 or around about the, the end of 22, beginning of 23. This as regards the forecasts and expectations. But I must also underline, as other speakers have done, the fact that these projections all projections that are being published by the analysts are still subject to different levels of uncertainty that are going to clearly condition the speed and depth of recovery. And I will try to summarize very briefly some of these main risks. The first one has to do with the pandemic, the health crisis. We don't know when the uh, health crisis is actually going to come to an end, but we must highlight and uh, emphasize that in terms of the Im economic impact, the degree of adaptation to the restrictions of the crisis of the different economies, not just the Spanish economy, has uh, increased uh, with successive waves. Potential restrictions associated with the crisis will condition the dynamic of international tourism, which is very important to Spain, obviously. Uh, and in the projections that I've just mentioned of the Bank of Spain, we presume that recovery of the volume of tourism uh, and the recovery won't be full until 2023. We won't go back to pre-pandemic levels. But depending on restrictions, that recovery might take place sooner or later. So it's an element of uncertainty, which is very important. We also are uncertain about the length of the alterations observed in the global supply chains, the bottlenecks in the global supply chains, which are more persistent than we thought initially. And we also know that they're having a negative impact on uh, economic activity in certain industries, especially. We believe that these bottlenecks will be, or their effects will be, uh, will decrease after uh, or during the second half of the year, but there's a level of uncertainty associated to that. And we must also highlight an element of uncertainty which is associated with the use that homes and people could make of the money that they've saved, uh, that has been saved during the pandemic. The Bank of Spain has published forecasts on this. Uh, that could uh, be equivalent to six points of the GDP, and the use of those savings during the crisis is going to condition what might happen with uh, private consumer consumption. All analysts and the Bank of Spain presume that uh, people will only make partial use of that money that they've saved uh, because mo a lot of it ha is in the hands of high income families that will not consume so much and that a lot of the uh, expenses that they didn't have to uh, cover uh, a lot of that money won't be recoverable, but um, 
there is uh, probably going to be a greater level of expense in any event. Another area of uncertainty is the use of European funds. Given the uh, volume of these funds, we know that they're going to be an absolutely essential factor in terms of the economic development of Spain and the other countries in the EU over the next few years. The Bank of Spain contemplates projects being carried out to the tune of more than 60 billion euros between 2021 and 2023. But it's also obvious that the uh, econo final economic impact of these projects will depend on the uh, rate of absorption, design, execution, and to the extent to which these projects are associated with structural reforms. And in 2021, there has been a delay in the use of the funds, which clearly reflects the complexity of uh, these projects and starting up these projects in such a short period of time. Our priority now will be, obviously, to select the best projects that can offer uh, greater growth to the economy and at a faster rate and also together with uh, ambitious structural reforms. Another element of uncertainty that I would like to mention has to do with the possibility uh, that, uh, that the crisis continues to have an impact on the, uh, on, uh, the productive tissue of the nation and employment. Most analysts tend to think that these effects could be reduced uh, in this time as a result of the economic policies that have been applied. And most of the uh, sectors of business recovered at the end of last year. So their levels of invoicing and turnover has gone back to normal levels and they've improved their income, their liquidity and their solvency. But obviously, we also know that recovery is still not complete, especially in sectors and industries that have been most affected by the pandemic, where we've seen, and this has been published by the Bank of Spain in our reports, where we've seen that the quality of credit has worsened slightly, and also uh, quite a, uh, th there is a, an increase in the number of companies that have um, uh, gone broke. But um, this will also be an important area of uncertainty. And uh, finally, I will mention another new uh, aspect which was unexpected in the last few months, which has to do with the strong increase in inflation that we've seen. This, we've published several articles about this, is a result of different factors. Mm, the base, basic uh, effects that are associated with the drop in prices at the beginning of the pandemic, but also supply chain problems, restrictions, uh, increased prices of electricity and power, other goods, and also has to do with the effects of the recovery of demand of certain services. We believe that the dis gradual disappearance of those basic effects, the bottlenecks in the supply chains, and the stabilization of the energy prices, uh, which will probably take place, will reduce uh, the pressure of inflation throughout 2022 and the Bank of Spain in its forecasts in December. What we said was that inflation, well, was at 3% at the end of 21, an inflation which on average would be this year slightly below 4%, but with a slowdown over the year, especially in the second half of the year, and inflation will probably be below 2% by the end of the year and below 2% in the next few years. It's obvious that, well, regarding this, there is also uncertainty, and there are two elements of uncertainty that I would like to underscore, which um, could generate an inflationary process. The first one would come from a scenario of correction of energy power, uh, prices that is different from what the future markets suggest as a result of geopolitical tensions, which have also been responsible partially for the increase in energy prices. And secondly, something that we're highlighting a lot at the Bank of Spain, a high transmission of uh, or an increase in salaries would also uh, feed into uh, further inflation 
situation. But uh, uh, at, the, at this time, the growth of salaries is moderate. After describing the economic situation and listing the risks, I would like to tell you what our or what the econo economic policy should be from our point of view, because we think it's going to play a key role and it's going to be important to manage economic policies in order to give our support to the economic recovery. In the case of monetary policy, recent developments are coherent and are in line with a return to moderate inflation in the medium term. And medium term is the term that is important for designing the monetary policy at the European Central Bank, as was seen uh, uh, when the uh, strategies were reviewed by the European Bank in June last year. But we must pay attention to the possibility of uh, new factors that destabilize the situation in terms of inflation. As you know, the Council of Government of the European Central Bank decided to start the purchase or discontinue the purchase of assets, and that has a – that reflects uh, – in part the situation, but given this high level of uncertainty that we have and that I've just described, we continue to, at the Council of Government, still continue to have uh, an outlook that uh, is very flexible in terms of what we're going to do in the future. Three aspects are included in this. On the one hand, we have the option of reactivating the pandemic program if it's necessary. On the other hand, we are going to be flexible in terms of buying assets through reinvestments in the pandemic program or through the pandemic program, which we've extended until the end of 2024. And finally, and I think this is very important to be highlighted, one of the key references of, of our monetary uh, policy is the forward guidance which conditions the first increase of uh, the interest rates and uh, the finalization of the purchase program to and associate it to the uh, forecasts uh, in terms of inflation at each given time. So we are recommending that if the conditions that, are, uh, that we have today continue, uh, we do not expect to have interest rate uh, increases in 2022. That regarding monetary policy. In terms of fiscal policy, I think we all agree that we must now focus on the sectors that are affected by the crisis, companies that are feasible, and with um, uh, temporary measures to uh, uh, make the structural situation better. And we must now uh, concentrate on medium term and short term uh, measures for budgetary uh, um, for addressing the budget. I think it's also time to focus on potential changes and structural damage that could develop as a result of the crisis. And I think that we must also recognize that as a result of the crisis, but also as a result of the need to – that we all see to face the energy transition, digitalization, I think we are probably in one of the times in recent decades where there is a greater need for reallocating factors between companies and sectors, and the economic policy must not uh, put obstacles in the way of that process. It must facilitate that process uh, in the industries that require it. And I also want to mention that the Spanish economy already had many challenges such as low productivity, aging of the population, inequalities. So now the time has come to face up to those problems with ambitious structural reforms. And I want to mention before I finish how we should manage the economic policy against the background of the current spike in inflation. From the point of view of the different uh, economic policies, the most disadvantaged layers of society should be fully supported, but at the same time, 
companies and workers should internalize that the degree of uh, inflation will depend on the response given by economic agents. We know that in Spain and Europe, we are suffering uh, the consequences of uh, increases in the price of energy that we don't produce. So citizens should be made aware of the need to avoid uh, um, contributing to the escalation of uh, these prices. But I believe that the economic prospects uh, of the Spanish economy, once uh, the distortions are behind us, are quite uh, promising. And once European funds become uh, widely available, but the fact that uh, or whether these uh, expectations do materialize will depend on the behavior of economic agents and on how well the economic policies are managed. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Governor of the Bank of Spain. As I was saying at the beginning, we are honored to have with us the Minister of Foreign Affairs, European Union and Foreign Aid. Mr. Albaris, you have the floor. Dear friends, President of BM6, although you are not physically with us, CEO of Aon, Chairman of the Spanish Stock Market, Governor of the Bank of Spain, even if you are just with us remotely, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me. And also, I want to thank them for organizing this event, because there are times like this one which, you know, are particularly difficult, not only for Spain, but for the rest of the world. So it is very important for events to be held in full safety. In Spain, we have one of the highest rates of vaccination in the world, and it is wonderful for all of you to be physically with us supporting this event. This event is always very important, but it is even more important today. I wanted to wish uh, all the different uh, attendees uh, a very warm welcome to Spain, uh, whether they have come physically or virtually. I hope that once again, this edition of the Spain Investor Day is a success, and I would like to wish you all an excellent 2022. A year where expectations are good, and the Spanish government is decided to promote the economic transformation that the country needs. And we are in a favorable, in a favorable environment with consolidated growth, and this allows us or has allowed us to recover pre-pandemic growth levels. And there have been two main impulses. The first one resulting from the high vaccination rate. 90% of the Spanish population has a full vaccination schedule. And the second element is going to be the recovery and resilience plan, which is going to be 
supported by a very robust public investment scheme. We want to lay the foundations for sustainable growth, sustainable from an economic, an environmental, and a social point of view. In short, a project for a country based on four transformations, the ecological transformation, the digital transformation, gender equality, and social and territorial cohesion. And in the last uh, few months, we have taken significant strides. For example, the parties that have been approved in different strategic areas, such as renewable energies, electrical vehicles, and others which are now under analysis, such as the aerospace. The parties represent a huge investment opportunity in the future of Spain, in the transformational future of the country. And then, you know, an agreement was achieved to reform the employment market, which is going to make it possible to promote the creation of stable, high-quality jobs in this economic cycle that is about to begin. So a whole host of factors that contribute to this reformation impulse. And you can see that the European Commission has authorized the um, outlay of uh, the next generation funds. And this coincides with an acceleration in the execution of the most important reforms for Spain. And the economic prospects for Spain are positive. The IMF, the European Commission, the OECD have pointed out that Spain is amongst the most dynamic economies in the world. And this economic reactivation is felt in the in the job market. We have recovered the job levels of the of uh, before the pandemic. We in 2021 we created almost 800,000 jobs. And with this, I want to convey my conviction that Spain offers unmatched opportunities at present. All of these uh, policies that I mentioned underscore the characteristics that make Spain a very attractive destination for foreign investment. Spain is the fourth economy in the Eurozone and the 14th economy in the world in terms of GDP. But Spain is first and foremost an open economy. Spain's international dimension is reflected in very clear indicators. Spain is the 14th world investor and the 18th exporter of merchandises. Uh, the degree of openness of the country is of 67 percent. These are pre-pandemic data, and now there's almost 200,000 exporting companies in Spain, 55,000 of which are regular exporters. And in the case of the IBEX companies, 66 percent of the business is made abroad. And then we should also mention intangible assets. For example, our common language, the Spanish language, the economic value of the Spanish language is very important because it facilitates economic transactions. It represents shared cultural references with our brothers and sisters from Latin America, and it facilitates the development of industries related to our language. For those reasons, Spanish contributes an additional value 
as a tool for growth and as a tool for business internationalization. And of course, we shouldn't forget that Spain is an, 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 a, a huge tourism power. It's the second country in the world in terms of number of visitors. In, in Madrid, we have the headquarters of the WTO, the World Tourism Organization. Spain is a leader in terms of competitiveness in the tourist sector. And it is a wonderful destination that is really sought after by visitors from the world over who are attracted to us not only by our monuments, our cuisine, but also they also feel attracted to the Spanish personality. And the most recent data confirmed the recovery of the tourism sector, saying Spain is perceived as a safe destination with more and more international connectiveness. Vaccination is still the best protection against COVID-19. And we need to keep it up and we need to keep increasing the number of vaccinated people. And the world can count on Spanish solidarity. We have done, Spain has donated 50 million vaccines, 23 million to Africa and 21 to Latin America. The Spanish companies have become leaders in technology and with great growth potential. Internationally present companies are key for our recovery. Also, they are key for innovation and for creating high quality jobs. And those companies are given great importance by the government. There is a firm commitment with sustainability. With the technological solutions that these companies contribute across different sectors, But it is also important to mention that these companies collaborate with companies from other uh, countries in the world on different types of projects, which is very good for the image and for the reputation of Spain in the world. And it speaks to uh, the power of Spain in terms of its foreign projection. Our priority in the pandemic is to consolidate the e a fair economic recovery which should reach everybody. It should reach all Spaniards. And this should be seen across all our territories. Internationally, we should face up to the challenges I mentioned before which are generated by globalization, but which have become more intense because of the pandemic. The digital revolution, growing technolo technological competition, the environment, health risks that we've seen emerging, and at the same time, it's more necessary than ever to strengthen the multilateral framework and the rules of the game. We must not forget the challenges that were already present before COVID uh, that are associated with the aging of population, inequality, and COVID uh, makes inequality worse. And uh, our commitment, our commitment is not to leave 
We are committed to not leaving a single Spaniard behind. And I want to send you a message of trust and confidence in this process of transformation. I want to send a message to international investors that are here in person or virtually uh, following us. I want to invite you to participate in the promising future of Spain. The government is convinced that uh, economic growth in Spain will be strengthened by progress and gradual development of the recovery program and that the reforms and investments that are being made and carried out will be more and more important in terms of promoting sound, inclusive and well-balanced growth. That has been the case in the last quarter of 2021 and will continue to be the case this year and next year, 2022, 2023. I want to conclude by inviting you to be part of this huge effort to reform and further update our country, which will allow us to leap forward into a new economic model where we are going to be on the front line. Thank you very much. The minister has concluded his uh, presentation, but we're not going to let him go just yet because we want this to be a dialogue, a forum for dialogue and debate between companies, investors, and not just a monologue uh, where people explain their ideas, but also where investors, international investors that are here at the different countries of the world can uh, pose their questions to the members of the government. I want to thank the minister for being here and to have a dialogue with investors now. And the gen in general, the government, they're making a tremendous effort of transparency. Uh, the question, the first question is, Spain has brought 12,357 uh, million in investment, but that's 22% less than 2020. What do you think the causes are for this drop in investment, foreign investment in Spain? Do you think that in 2022 we're going to recover uh, that level of investment? Well, the reason obviously is that the world and Spain therefore uh, is facing the most serious crisis of the last century, a health crisis that came out of a financial crisis and then led into a social crisis. Uh, Direct investment has dropped by 35% in the world, much more than in Spain. Foreign investment in the world. And there's a bias towards the most, the most developed countries, which are Spain and other uh, developed countries. So the drop in Spain is not as high as the drop in the rest of the world at a very uh, serious time. This shows that uh, people uh, trust our country and uh, people have confidence in the future of our country. Solidarity in Europe, the plan for transformation and resilience, recovery and resilience, the European funds that are arriving, the high rates of vaccination in Spain, make Spain one of the countries in the world that uh, has recovered uh, uh, at a faster rate and uh, we are ready, uh, vaccinated and uh, uh, can meet the challenge. And we have the funds and we'll have more funds over the next few months to face up to this challenge, which will be twofold. Uh, his, well, first of all, uh, we have to get out of this crisis and all of us should get out of the crisis. And the other one is to transform our economy, which is something which we were already doing, but uh, we're going to speed it up. The second question, there are Spanish companies that have significant interests in Morocco. Have the relations with Morocco gone back to normal? Should Spanish companies be careful with that market? No, there's no, no, no problem at all. Morocco is a strategic uh, partner of Spain. And uh, Nasser Barita, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Morocco, is probably I would say undoubtedly 
the minister that I spoke to most, that I speak to most frequently in the world, and it's normal. They're a neighbor, they're a strategic partner, and we have common interests. It's a complex relationship, but it's positive for it to be complex because there are a whole series of complex interests and because uh, these relations between neighbors are always complex in the best sense of the word. But we're trying to build a relationship for the 21st century where companies and corporations must uh, participate. And I'm saying this, these are, this is not just words. I go back to the speech of the King of Morocco on the 21st of August, where he spoke about that kind of relationship, which was responded uh, answered by the president of the government at Tarajan uh, in equal terms. And I would like to underline the uh, very good work that Morocco and Spain are doing in terms of channeling the irregular migration flows and just over the Christmas period in 15 days, thanks to the collaboration, collaboration of Morocco between Morocco and Spain, and it wouldn't be possible without them, we have prevented uh, more than 1,000 people um, illegally uh, entering uh, our borders. So we must not be uh, afraid of Morocco at all. Quite the opposite. The government has approved a law for cooperation for development to replace the 1998 law and will invest significantly in this area. That law will try to promote public and private alliances and uh, the and we'll try to promote um, the participation of companies through bids and different uh, competitions. How are you going to manage that process? Yes, yesterday we approved the article that was approved by the Council of Ministers that um, will now go to Parliament to establish a new law of cooperation 25 years after the first and only uh, cooperation law we've had in Spain. Since then, in the world, many important things have happened that had to be updated, and many things had to be updated. Uh, the Sustainable uh, Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Accord, and also the development of financial cooperation, which is a more and more frequent and common trend in the world of development. That law, for the first time, is going to make legal for the administration of Spain, the regions, and local councils altogether. We're going to participate in that effort to reach the goal of 0.7% of uh, gross national income, uh, which we were committed to to help uh, officially help development in the 2030 horizon, but at the same time mobilize and use other funds. This law, and this is probably one of the key elements, most innovative elements, as compared to the law of 1998, it was 25 years ago, that was focused exclusively on official help and aid to development. And we're not going to help countries that need our help. Many of them are in our area by just having official uh, aid. We have to update and get the private sector involved. And we created a new fund, which is FEDES, which is aimed at financial cooperation so that private companies can participate in feasibility, technical and financial feasibility studies of uh, development projects. And in order for our cooperation to uh, work as a kind of development bank. And uh, this law will not just project uh, the values of Spaniards and of Spain to combat uh, inequality and to be more solidarian. It doesn't make us a better country. It also defends our own interests because as the as COVID has reminded us, the welfare of Spaniards uh, also depends on the welfare of our surrounding con countries and the international community. Nobody will be safe until we're all safe from COVID-19. Uh, irregular immigration, political conflict, 
is rooted in inequality, and we're going to combat that because we in Spain and our, our wish to and our values are those values, and because this is a way to defend the interests of Spain itself. We've spoken about a strategic partner for our country, Morocco. The next question is about the U.S. What are the relations between Spain and the U.S.? Are you worried? that uh, the president of the U.S. has not yet spoken to the president of Spain, as he has done with other world leaders. Well, uh, Biden, President Biden has spoken to President Sanchez several times. He had a very long phone call when, in August, he asked for permission to use the Moran and Rota basis uh, for a lot of the collaborators of the U.S. to uh, go through, pass through. I've spoken to Tony Blinken, uh, the minister in America, in the U.S. Uh, often I had a long meeting uh, at the OCD me um, um, meeting, an hour and a half we spent together. And the relations between the U.S. and Spain are going to get even stronger over the next few months, which is normal because we are going to have the NATO summit on the 29th and 30th of June in Madrid. There are two things. The U.S. could have chosen many countries for their collaborators in Afghanistan to make use of, but President Biden phoned uh, President Sanchez for two reasons. First of all, because we got the technical ability to do something like that. That's why they chose the base of Tarakan. Um, and Ursula von der Leyen said that Spain was an example of the soul of uh, Europe. But for another reason, the U.S. knows that Spain is a reliable partner, is a, a reliable ally. And uh, secondly, because, well, the, the NATO summit in Spain this year is not just any summit. We are going to introduce the strategic concept of NATO in that summit. Those of you who are not familiar with these concepts, the strategic concept is a concept that is going to rule the life of the organization and the allies, all of us, for another 10 years, which is when NATO updates <coughs> their strategic concept. And that will decide what we consider our, our threats, our capacities, the, what we need to face up to our threats, and how we want the allies including Spain, of course, to be heard in the world strongly. And we decide that uh, collectively. And of course, if the U.S. did not think Spain was uh, uh, a reliable top level ally, the summit would not be organized in Madrid. So uh, it is a tight relationship that we have. It was before this government. Uh, it was already present before this government, obviously, but is going to be strengthened over the next few months. This is a forum of investors, listed companies, and in the last few years, one of the investors says in his question, one of the factors that has affected Spanish companies that are listed is their exposure to Latin America. How do you think and what do you think about the future and the relations with Latin America? Well, for me, it's a top priority in our exterior and foreign policy. In fact, in the uh, restructuring uh, process of the ministry, I've created a, a, a secretariat that is exclusively and specifically devoted to Latin America and the Caribbean and to Spain in the world because it is that uh, common language that brings us together. And I think that there is a Latin American way of life and being in the world, and Spain and America, Latin America, and Europe and Latin America, because we must remember that it is uh, the most, the region that is most compatible with Europe in the whole world. And um, everything we do together is going to reinforce us uh, mutually. And my desire is to collaborate with all countries in Latin America. For Spain, all countries in Latin America are equally important. Regardless of political colors, geographical situation, and I would just establish one limitation, which is the respect of the values that are common to the Latin American community. And a community is much more than an association. A community is a set of principles, a set of values. It's a family. And governments 
that do not abide by those common values will have difficulties in establishing a dialogue with Spain. The future of Latin America is a promising future. We can see that democracy is taking root in the continent and in areas where, you know, there are exceptions such as Nicaragua. On Monday, I met the wives of two political prisoners in Nicaragua who were jailed by Ortega. And, you know, whenever things like that happen, you know, everybody, the whole of the family feels attacked. And what is the current situation of Spain with, our, with Algeria? Is our gas supply assured? Yes. Our, Algeria is a strategic partner of Spain, and it has shown to be so once and over again. I traveled to Algiers recently. I was welcomed by the president and by the minister of foreign affairs, and both of them gave me full guarantees that the energy supply of Spain was guaranteed. And what Spanish gas companies are telling me is that they are being as good as their word. So we can be totally reassured. Algerian gas is guaranteed, and Algeria is a strategic partner of our country. I would like to finish by thanking the investors who have connected to this call for having followed us throughout the day. I also want to thank uh, all the different companies. We've had over 500 one-to-one -one meetings today. I know, Minister, that you're traveling tomorrow, so I'm very grateful to you for having squeezed us in. Uh, I want to thank uh, the audience who have uh, joined us physically, and we are all going to be looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you.